Oh, hey. Yeah, that's right. Talking Olive. What you might call an attempt at making the next 10 minutes a lighthearted journey for all. So I'm a stuffed Spanish olive. I grew up in California, but I take my heritage pretty seriously. You could say that my motivation stems from the deep Spanish roots of my family tree. Anyway, for culture, beauty, and outright influence in the shape of the world as we know it, Spain enjoys its share. Cervantes, Picasso, Conquistadors, Sherry, St. Ignatius of Loyola, Paella. Ooh, wait, go back one. No, not, not the paella. Ah, oh, I know what you're thinking. Awesome, a happening profile of a saint. Well, Ignatius didn't start off as a saint. As a matter of fact, you could say that he took the scenic route to sainthood. Well, here we are, the castle of Loyola in northern Spain, birthplace of St. Ignatius. Not the humble beginnings one might imagine for a saint. In 1491, Inigo Lopez de Loyola was born into a family of minor nobility. At age 13, he was sent to live with Juan Velasquez, a family friend, who also happened to be a treasurer in the court of Ferdinand and Isabella. Ignatius the young courtier developed grand visions of chivalry and battlefield glory. He took great care of and pride in his physical appearance and was no stranger to the ladies. In addition to walking around town wearing a sword, he was known to drink, gamble, and even brawl. Yup, he was about as far from a saint as you'd like to get, but hey, he's young, there's still time. In his late 20s, Ignatius found direction and purpose as a respected army officer. Though he was a dedicated and courageous soldier, his lifestyle stayed the same, and his motivation still leaned toward the vain and glorified. Funny enough that it was his appetite for glory that would change his life. Pamplona, May 21st, 1521. Outnumbered 13 to 1 and encouraged by Ignatius, Mayor Miguel Herrera chooses to fight rather than surrender Pamplona to invading French forces. Six hours into the futile battle, Ignatius, leading the effort, is struck by a cannonball that rips open his left calf and shatters his right shin. With their larger-than-life champion gravely wounded, the Spanish troops lose their spirit and surrender. The French were so impressed with Ignatius' skill and bravery that they treated his wounds and carried him home to Loyola. Ah, sorry. This is where things get ugly. The doctors had to re-break and reset Ignatius' leg. After it healed, a protruding bone created a lump, which did not agree with Ignatius' vanity. He had the extra bones sawn off and the shortened legs stretched out with weights. Since the state of medicine in 1521 was soaked rags and rusty saws, and television was a good 450 years off, Ignatius began a very long, painful, and boring recovery. To pass the time, Ignatius read the only two books in the house, The Life of Christ and The Lives of the Saints. Not his first choice by far, but better than nothing. Gradually, though, as he reflected for days and months on end upon what he was reading, the thoughts and desires that had always motivated Ignatius were being challenged by an increasing desire to serve Christ in some meaningful way. With his wounds healed, and after a lot of contemplation on his place in the world, and against his family's protests, Ignatius turns away from a life of wealth, excitement, and nobility, and decides to travel to the Holy Land to serve pilgrims there. He sets out for the sanctuary at Montserrat, where he confesses his sins for three days, leaves his sword at the altar of the Black Madonna, and trades his fancy clothes for those of a beggar. A penniless drifter, Ignatius finds shelter in a cave in the nearby town of Manresa. Though he has confessed his sins, he struggles with his own humanity, his relationship with God, his ultimate role. Over the course of the next year, as Ignatius meditates on these things, he jots down reflections on his prayer experiences. These notes become the basis for the spiritual exercises, which have allowed millions of people to better understand themselves, each other, and their relationship with God for over 500 years. 
but that's a whole different video. Though he lived with hunger, sickness, and uncertainty throughout his time in Manresa, Ignatius was realizing life-altering truths, the greatest of which came as he rested on the banks of the Cardinair River one afternoon. Staring into the water, he was overcome by an understanding that God was in all things, and that his presence wasn't confined to buildings or ceremonies. This great revelation of the dynamic nature and presence of God in everyday life would be a major founding principle of the Jesuits. More importantly, it motivates Ignatius to stop living in a cave and get going to the Holy Land. By way of Barcelona and Venice, Ignatius lands in the port of Jaffa in August of 1523, and after a short time in Jerusalem, he's sent right back by the Franciscans. They didn't want to be responsible for the safety of a pilgrim do-gooder wandering around an inhospitable city. Back in Spain, Ignatius began to counsel others in the basics of his spiritual exercises. But the Inquisition was on, and the authorities weren't thrilled with the laymen teaching his original concepts. Though eventually set free, he was barred from preaching until he secured some credentials by way of an advanced university degree. See where this is going? Well, Ignatius' childhood education left something to be desired, namely Latin. So, starting from scratch, 33-year-old Ignatius swallowed his pride and enrolled himself in classes with little kids and teenagers. After two years of being the only student with a beard, Ignatius was ready for college. He got into trouble again at the University of Alcala and was jailed, after when she went to the University of Salamanca. Sort of. Tired of the harassment and lost in the inflexible education structure of Spanish institutions at the time, Ignatius headed off to Paris. At the U of Paris, Ignatius found an entirely different educational experience that stressed progressively building knowledge and active participation throughout a course of study. He also finds like-minded individuals like Francis Xavier and Peter Faber. After completing his studies and being ordained, Ignatius and a handful of buddies set up in Rome. Since the Holy Land was off limits, they decided that the best way to serve would be to form a community at the disposal of the Pope. Though they had never intended on in forming an organized group, on September 27th, 1540, Pope Paul III gave formal approval to the brandy new order of the Society of Jesus. But there was a lot of work to be done, and with only 10 members, the Jesuits knew they would need greater numbers to have a meaningful impact on the world. Knowing the importance of a solid education, Ignatius and the Jesuits opened schools in Europe and Asia to instruct young recruits. By 1548, 10 colleges were turning out hundreds of highly educated young men, and the public took notice. It wasn't long before the Jesuits were asked to open schools for everyone, something they had never anticipated. From then on, the number of Jesuits soared, and Ignatius worked like a dog setting up schools and universities all over the world. So here we are, 28 Jesuit colleges and universities in the United States alone, where students study philosophy, law, medicine, theology, business, film, engineering, you name it. The scope of disciplines reaches back to a letter Ignatius wrote in 1551, stating that those who are now merely students in time will depart to play diverse roles. Their good education in life and doctrine will be beneficial to many others, with the fruit expanding more widely every day. Jesuit institutions require students to look beyond themselves and to participate in a world that could benefit from their talents. So, wondering where you fit into this picture? Segway! Whether a student, professor, or staff member, you're a part of a unique tradition in education that values critical thinking, social responsibility, and personal development for the betterment of all humankind. This isn't just a place to study, teach, or work. It's a state of being that is constantly evolving in concert with the world of which it is part. Well, folks, that's the whole story in a nutshell, as told by a small green fruit. You've got a lot to think about, and I've got a bull to fight. Hey, it's a cartoon. I can do anything I want. <laughs> Hopefully you found that entertaining. So that is pretty much, as he said, the life of St. Ignatius in a nutshell. And with that sort of background information, I wanted to introduce just a couple of key topics and fundamental ideas that are important to Ignatian spirituality. 
a phrase you might have heard go by very quickly in there during the Olives presentation was finding God in all things. This is a key concept in Ignatian spirituality because there are many different forms of spirituality in the Catholic Church. And they've been put together by different men and women over the course of the last 2000 years in different times and different places in response to different needs. For example, this parish has a strong background with the Benedictines and Benedictine spirituality involves sort of withdrawing from the world as a way to sort of enter into silence and encounter God that way. Ignatian spirituality has the same end to achieve union with God, to know God better, to be closer to God. But we take a very different path because Ignatius's idea was rather than withdrawing from the world, was to enter into the world, to recognize that God is active in the world as a whole and that we can find God everywhere that God is not just present when we're, with, when we're gathered together at church on Sundays. Of course, that is a privileged and important way for us to encounter God. We can also encounter God in our everyday lives, in the smile of someone we know, in the food that we're eating, in something we're learning if we're a student, in our jobs if we're working. And something to keep in mind is some people here finding God in all things and they think, oh, that's wonderful. I can see God in a sunset. And that's true. You know, the glory of God's creation points towards God. All the beauty and the love points towards God. But you can't just stop at that level. You can't just think that God is present in the good things. Because one of Ignatius's insights is that God is also present along with us in the dark moments of our lives. Because we have a God who became human, who entered into the human experience and knows exactly what it's like to suffer. And so God is present in the suffering of a malnourished child. God is present in a family trying to make ends meet. God is present in the dying and suffering of someone who has a terminal illness. We find God's presence for in all of these things because God is everywhere and is constantly trying to reveal himself to us. This informs what we do as Jesuits because Jesuits are called to go to all corners of the world. If the Benedictines withdraw to a monastery and find God in the silence of their work there, they're, they're contemplatives. They're finding God by entering into silence. We as Jesuits sometimes like to refer to ourselves as being contemplatives in action. And so we constantly are going out into the world and being active in the world. We meet people where they are and we find God in their activities. And then once we've encountered God, a very important part of our spirituality is then to reflect on our experiences. We ask ourselves, where was God in this encounter, in this experience? How was God present to us in that particular time and place? Another key concept for Ignatian spirituality is the idea of having a direct encounter with God. So what does this mean? Well, we can have a mediated encounter with God. That means there's something in between us and God that helps us relate to God. You know, this can be any, anything. So in a sense, the mass can be a mediated encounter with God because we encounter him through the sacraments. A direct encounter with God is a concept that God speaks to each of us directly. We believe as Jesuits that God has placed in each of our hearts a deep desire. God has created us for a particular purpose and is calling us to love him and serve him by carrying out that purpose. And we believe that by reflecting on our experiences and on our lives, we can encounter God and find that our deep, our truest, deepest desire at the center of our hearts is identical to God's deepest desire for us. And one of the key ways that we reflect and find out this information is actually by reflecting on our emotions. That there are spirits moving in our hearts. Some of them are psychological. You know, there are days that you feel good. There are days that you feel bad. There are days that you feel more like yourself. There are days that you feel less like yourself. 
But it's, what's important is that this is not just an intellectual exercise. That when we are noticing and paying attention to how we're moving emotionally, that can be a key sign of how God is moving in our hearts and attempting to relate to us. We're really just sort of skating over the surface on these topics, but I do wanna make sure that we pause at this point and see if anybody has any questions so far, this might be a good time for people to have a chance to ask those. So Joan, are there any questions that we've gotten so far? Um, there were some questions earlier. Uh, we okay. had a couple questions about uh, entering into the spiritual exercises. All right. So, you know, I mentioned that there is this book that Ignatius wrote called The Spiritual Exercises. And I said, that it's kind of a cookbook or a guidebook. So just to explain, um, the spiritual exercises are primarily a way of encountering God in a structured way. And there are many different ways of doing them. The sort of classical form of doing the spiritual exercises is to go away for a 30 day silent retreat and meet one-on-one -on -one with a spiritual director once a day who will sort of assign you different kinds of prayer experiences laid out in the book and also paying attention to how God is moving you as an individual. And over the course of the month, you can come to encounter God at a much deeper level by understanding who God knows you to be as an individual and where God is calling you and what God is asking you to do. That's sort of the classical form of the spiritual exercises. A lot of people don't have the time to sort of take a month out of their lives and go do that. And so there are other ways of doing the spiritual exercises. There's something that we sometimes refer to as the 19th annotation, which just means paragraph 19 from that book, says that what you can do is perhaps do it in everyday life. And so rather than pray five times a day for an hour at a time for 30 days, you could say pray an hour a day each day over the course of a week, meet with your director once a week and still go on with your everyday life. There also are the possibility of say, just doing a portion of the exercises, maybe just doing the first part of it. All of these are ways of encountering God. Um, these are kinds of things that one tends to sort of build up to over time. It takes a certain amount of spiritual maturity to be ready to enter into the exercises themselves. I wouldn't recommend someone sort of walking in off the street who has not had a regular prayer life to start you know, by doing a 30-day silent retreat. That is almost guaranteed not to, not to go well. But there are particular exercises and insights from the spiritual exercises as a whole that can be used to develop your spiritual life, develop your relationship with Christ over time. Hopefully that answers the question people were asking. Uh, Joan, did I see another question pop up there? Yes. Yeah. Um Someone has asked, are there Jesuit seculars? In other words, can women uh, bind themselves to the order, uh, lay women? So each religious order within the, within the church is a particular gift to the church. And each of them is a little different. And a lot of the large religious families like the Benedictines and the Franciscans and the Dominicans have a men's order and a women's order. And then very often will also have what's called a third order, which is for people who don't want to take formal vows as a religious, but find the spirituality of that particular order meaningful to them and want to bind themselves to that order in a perpetual way. Each order reflects the charism and insights of its founder. And so St. Benedict had his sister, St. Scholastica, and so they founded both male and female branches of the Benedictines. St. Francis had his friend, St. Clair, and so there are male and female branches of the Franciscans. Other orders don't have both male and female branches. So for example, the Sisters of Mercy, who have had a long and proud tradition here in, uh, in the Charlotte area, are purely an order for women. There is no male branch of the Sisters of Mercy. Similarly, uh, Ig Ignatius discerned whether he wanted to be found an order for women and decided based on his insight and the time where he was, that he did not think that a women's order was going to be part of the Jesuit family. What has happened instead over time is any number of women have gone out and looked at Ignatian spirituality and the Jesuit constitutions 
and founded orders of their own inspired by the Jesuits. And so, for example, the Sisters of St. Joseph and the Religious of the Sacred Heart of Jesus share the spirituality of the Society of Jesus. Um, and just as we don't have a second order of women, we also do not have a third order. We don't have that as part of our charism of having a way of lay men or women to bind themselves canonically to the order. What we do have are a huge number of lay collaborators who find a great deal of life in Ignatian spirituality and work with us at our universities and our parishes and our retreat houses. Um, sometimes getting involved in what are known as Christian life communities, which are small communities uh, based in Ignatian spirituality, which are not that kind of third order, but are a way of building a community for individuals based in Ignatian spirituality. So I hope that answers your question. Um, we have anything else in the queue there at this point, Jim? Uh, one, one more question. Um, okay. We have, uh, how can we deal with all the anger, hatred, and division in our country? And maybe we can talk about that in an Ignatian manner. All right. Well, one of the things that, one of Ignatius's insights, as I mentioned, is the importance of reflection. We can find, if we believe that we can find God in all things, we believe that we can find God somehow at work in this division. How would we do that? Well, the first step would be to step back and reflect on the experience of anger. Where is this anger coming from? Is this righteous anger? Or is this anger that is based in hatred? Is this division that's coming from a cry for justice? Or is this division that's coming from a deep injustice and a desire to inflict injustice? The first step would be to try and step back and pay attention to the movements in our hearts to understand where this kind of anger and division and hatred is coming from. Because the first step of moving towards God is to recognize if you are moving away from God. And so one of the things we could do is we could reflect on our own hearts and then also we could reflect on society as a whole. And you may be asking yourself, okay, well, what do you mean reflect? Well, there is a particular tool that I think uh, is really at the bedrock of Ignatian spirituality. And it's a kind of prayer that we call the exam. It's a tool that Jesuits and a lot of our lay collaborators use on a daily basis. Some people use it on a weekly or monthly basis. Jesuits are asked to pray it twice a day. It's a way of reflecting deliberately on the movements of our heart over the last 24 hours. And then over time, if you pray this prayer over and over again, as you begin to detect patterns at work, you can then use that as a way to start making decisions for how to move forward. And so at this point, I'd like to transition to sort of our next little thing, which is going to be an example of the exam. I'm just gonna sort of guide everyone through the exam. It's a prayer that we're gonna take about uh, maybe probably hopefully about 10 minutes to do. And so again, I invite you to get comfortable and I'm going to hopefully share the right thing. Yes, all right. The exam has five steps to it. Everyone agrees that there are five steps. No one agrees what those five steps are. But here is my particular take on the five steps of the exam. This is a prayer that I do every day at the end of the day. And so what I do is I sort of find myself in a comfortable sitting position. Close my eyes, make sure I'm sitting in a, a way that's gonna be comfortable for me to live, sit for about 10 minutes. And the first thing I do is that I recall that I'm in the presence of God. This is a way of centering myself. And so I invite you to do that with me now to sit quietly and recall that God is here with us, wherever we are, whatever we're doing. God is present to us and we are present to God. So just take a moment to sit quietly and rejoice in that fact.
The second step is to give thanks for favors received. Ignatius teaches us that gratitude is the bedrock of any form of spiritual growth. And so what I would encourage you to do is think back over just the last 24 hours. Think about something good that happened today and be concrete about it. Maybe you had something for lunch that tasted particularly good. Maybe someone was kind to you in a way you didn't expect. Maybe you received a little piece of good news. Whatever it is, just look back at the last 24 hours, reflect on these little things, savor them, and say thank you to God for them. Now we come to what I consider to be the heart of the exam. We ask for the Holy Spirit to help us to look back over the last 24 hours, honestly and lovingly, seeing it through God's eyes. Just look at the last day. If you want, it can be just since you got up this morning. And ask for the Holy Spirit to help you look at that the way God does. Because when God looks at you, God is infinitely just but God is also infinitely loving. And so when God looks back over the course of the day with you, you can see where you have been the person God has created you to be, where you have been the most yourself, where you felt closest to God, where you felt joy. But also you can see the times when you've fallen short when you failed to be the person God created you to be fully, where you felt alone or scared or sorrowful, or perhaps you've hurt those around you for reasons you may not even understand. Ask the Holy Spirit to guide you through this and spend just the next few minutes looking back over what happened in your life today, letting it play before you like a film and note those moments where you felt close to God and those where you felt further away. Each and every one of us falls short in some way each day. God knows this and wants to help us with that. And so for the fourth step, we express remorse for our shortcomings. We tell God that we're sorry for those times where we failed to live up to fully be who he has created us to be. And we ask for his forgiveness. And finally, we begin to look to the future. Our final step, we ask for the Holy Spirit's help for moving forward tomorrow. We ask the Spirit to support us so that tomorrow we can do a better job than we did today because we know we can't do that on our own. We need the Lord's help. And so we ask the Holy Spirit to be close to us, to support us so that we can tomorrow start over again 
and try to be better than we were today. And so take a moment now to do that. And when you're ready, we can come back and continue our time together now tonight. So the exam is a key and fundamental form of Ignatian prayer. It really does lie at the heart of Ignatian spirituality. <clears throat> there are concepts in there where I mentioned about feeling closer to God and feeling more like yourself feeling further away from God and feeling less like yourself. The terms that we tend to use in Ignatian spirituality for these two kinds of experiences are consolation and desolation. Consolation and desolation are key ideas for Ignatian spirituality because any true long-term spiritual journey is going to involve experiences of consolation and desolation and real periods of consolation and desolation. There will be whole periods of time where you feel closer to God and periods of time where you feel further away from God. An important thing to remember is that just because you are feeling further away from God and you cannot feel God's presence, that doesn't mean he's not there. These are normal parts of the spiritual journey. And one of Ignatius's insights was to recognize that we can pay attention to these movements of consolation and desolation and actually make use of them. Because somebody before was asking about sort of what we can do with national feelings of anger and this division. Well, as I was saying before, the first step is to reflect on it. And after you reflect, you then move on to something we call discernment, which is a way of trying to figure out how to move forward how to make decisions. And consolation and desolation are important in that. Because if you pray the examine over and over again, over time, you'll begin to notice patterns in your life. You'll see that there are times and activities that constantly seem to lead you closer to God, constantly make you feel more like the person God has created you to be. And there are other kinds of activities that can lead you further away from God. And so looking back at the Olive video again, when Ignatius had had his injury and was back home in the castle recovering, that was one of his first experiences of discernment because he came to realize that when he looked at his old dreams of worldly glory and wine, women, and song, that might have made him feel good for a few minutes, but immediately was followed almost always by a feeling of sadness and emptiness and hollowness. Whereas when he thought about serving the Lord, that brought him a more lasting sense of joy that made him feel more alive. That's how he began his journey of discernment, by recognizing that these feelings that he's experiencing can inform how to make a good decision. He can discern among the movements of the spirits in his heart in order to find a way to move forward. So discernment can be used for an individual, but it also can be used on a broader level a lot of Jesuit institutions really like to embrace the idea of discernment, which is more than simply adding up the pros and cons and saying, what's the better decision to make? It's really a question of trying to figure out what is God's will for this situation. A lot of people would say that God's will is unknowable. And ultimately, none of us can possibly know the fullness of God's will. But Ignatian Spirit, one of Ignatius's insights is that through the process of discernment, we can come to know at least some of God's will for us with some level of sureness. And so through the process of discernment, paying attention to the movement of the spirits, we can begin to know God's will for us. Um, we still have a little ways to go, but I wanna make sure that we include enough time in our presentation tonight for people to ask any questions that they have. So I wanna pause again. And Joan, are there any more questions that have come in that people wanted to ask? No, we do not have a question at this moment. Okay, that's fine. 
um, then I'll just have to vamp for a little more time. Um, one of the things that we have to think about then with Ignatian spirituality is, is all of this real? What do I do with this? Because it can sound very confusing when you first hear about Ignatian spirituality. You know, for some people, this is a form of prayer and form of spirituality that is incredibly life-giving. For others, it comes across as complete gobbledygook. And so there can be a question of sort of, how do I get started with this? And there are a number of different options available to you. You know, there are forms of prayer that Ignatius enjoys. Um, but again, I would not recommend trying to sort of pick up his book and read them yourself. Ignatian spirituality is a form of prayer that works best when it's accompanied by others. And here at St. Peter, we have a number of different programs that we try to use to sort of try and introduce people to Ignatian spirituality. And so let's see if I can try sharing my screen again. Um, and so we have a number of different uh -oh, programs. It's not letting me go to the there. Number of different programs available here to us at St. Ignatius um, that are designed to introduce our parishioners to it. So I realize I've put these up in the wrong order. Um, but if you're if you have no exposure to Ignatian spirituality in the past a good way that you might want to get involved with it would be to go on one of our Lenten retreats that are happening later this semester on February 20 and March 27. This would be an introduction to some of the forms of prayer that Ignatius uh, developed and would allow you to encounter some people who know more about Ignatian spirituality than you do to try and guide you through praying with these forms of prayer for the first time. And the nice thing is they're only about 90 minutes each. And so there's no long-term commitment involved in that. That's gonna happen during Lent. Later on in the semester, we're going to have uh, a program that is sort of a group workshop program for introducing people to doing the exam. It, a lot of people when they encounter the exam for the first time, it's through something like this where a Jesuit or a lay person is leading them through the exam. And sometimes they find that they get a lot out of it when someone leads them through it but it's not a prayer that they feel comfortable trying to do on their own. And so we're gonna have the exam program in the Easter season, season, I think in April, that if you want to sort of get involved with the group for a few weeks, it would give you an opportunity to learn more about it, have some people lead you through it a few times and have a chance to share your experience with others who are really sort of learning about this for the first time. On the other hand, if you're somebody who already has some experience with Ignatian spirituality and you've come to join us tonight, some of the other programs here at St. Peter might be more appropriate for you. For example, the Everyday Discernment program. So we were talking before about discernment and how you can apply it. This would be an opportunity for you to learn a little bit more about that in depth and start applying it in your own life. And so Everyday Discernment will be available uh, from February 3rd to March 10 on Wednesday evenings. And then finally, we have the Encountering the Living God program. This is probably our sort of most in-depth program that we offer. A person who gets very serious about Ignatius, Ignatian spirituality and prays with it on a regular basis is going to want to start meeting with a spiritual director, someone who can sort of reflect back to you what's going, what he or she is hearing from you and can help you see things a little bit more objectively that you may not be able to see on your own. Encountering the living God is a form of prayer where you get an opportunity to try out working with a spiritual director for six weeks. And if you find that that's extremely meaningful for you and you want to continue it, you might be able to then find someone who would be willing to serve as your spiritual director. The Jesuits here at the parish do that. And we also have a number of lay people here in the parish who have been getting trained as spiritual directors for the last few years and really would love to work with you. So that, is just a little bit of a taste of some of the directions you could go if you were interested in learning more about Ignatian spirituality. I've seen the chat button flashing at me. So I just wanted to see, were there any more questions that came up? Joan, there did is, anything else come up? By the way, there is another question. Okay. Someone asked um, about recommending authors or pieces of literature that 
reflect Ignatian spirituality? All right. Um, so the Jesuits have been around for about 500 years and a whole bunch of our guys have written many, many different books. Um, depending on where you're coming from, if you're looking for a very modern, very accessible entry into Ignatian spirituality, um, Father Jim Martin, of course, everything he does as a Jesuit is informed by Ignatian spirituality. And one of my favorite books of his is The Jesuit Guide to Almost Everything. It's, this is not a scholarly book. This is a book that's intended to be accessible to people. It gives you an opportunity to learn about the history of the Jesuits and Ignatian spirituality in a sort of breezy, fun way that's very easy to get into. If you're looking for a very short book on Ignatian spirituality, uh, David Fleming wrote a book called What is Ignatian Spirituality? The whole book's about that big. The whole thing's about 80, 80 very small pages. It's an easy way to read, uh, to get into that. If you're looking for something a little more in depth, um, just thinking, you know, that Kevin O'Brien wrote his Ignatian Adventure, which is also a, a, a sort of populist accessible version. Um, Bill Barry, anything by Bill Barry, B-A-R-R-Y, was a brilliant Jesuit spiritual director who unfortunately just passed away, I think just two months ago month ago. Um, and if you are someone who is coming from sort of a scientific background, uh, Pierre Théard de Chardin was a 20th century Jesuit anthropologist who really was attempting to grapple with questions of what we can learn from the sciences and from nature and from social sciences that can tell us about God. Um, oh, there was a question, sorry, just popped up. So the first author I mentioned was Father Jim Martin. M-A-R-T-I-N, um, he's everywhere. He's kind of the Jesuits guy for dealing with media. Um, he shows up on television a lot. He was the official or unofficial, I should say, uh, chaplain to the Colbert Nation when Stephen Colbert had his own uh, talk show. Jim has written many, many books. Um, I think that's what I'm gonna say at this point about that. I'm gonna give you everybody one last chance to ask questions before I think it's time for us to start thinking about our, our closing prayer for the evening. Going once, going Have you twice. seen the app reimagining the exam? And if so, what do you think of it? I have to confess, I am not familiar with, with that app. Uh, I think you said app, you said, not book, app. Yes, there is an okay. app. Um, um, I am familiar with Father Thibodeau's book on the examine, which I think is also called Reimagining the Examine. You know, what I gave you tonight was a very sort of straight down the middle, plain vanilla version of the examine. It's sort of a generalist version of the examine. Father Thibodeau's book is sort of an adaptation of the examine for many different particular circumstances. That's something that is very helpful for a lot of people because they find that they can apply it in a particular way for a particular circumstance. And it offers several dozen, several dozen different versions of it. And I know a lot of people have found that very helpful as a way of keeping their prayer fresh and of using it to discern with regard to particular areas. Joan, were you trying to say something else? We do use the book, uh, the Reimagining okay. the Examine, when we do our examine course. Okay. And so there are people who enjoy that app, as well as Sacred Space. That's another wonderful right. app for uh, daily prayer that will right. walk I believe that's through. run by the Irish Jesuits, it is. as I recall. Right. We now have some of these resources on our website under uh, the Our Parish page, um, so that there's a resource links uh, at the bottom of that page. Um, All right. Awesome. And we'll be glad uh, to send any of you who uh, joined us tonight, we'll send out some of these resources so you'll have them listed in an email. Great. Yeah, that's one of the reasons we asked all of you to sign up for this so that we would have contact information so that we would be able to send information to you after, the, after our program tonight was done 
because I'm sure many of you will be trying to remember the, the names that I said and the books that we mentioned. And so we want to make sure that we can put that information together for you in an email so that you have it in one place. All right. Um, anything else, Joan? Uh, we have uh, someone saying, I have, okay, uh, there's just a comment here. I love the Jesuits and the spirituality, but I struggle finding the examine. Um, well, as I said, the, you know, there are many different forms of spirituality in the Catholic church. If one form, one type of prayer works well for you, then I would encourage you to embrace that. And I would also encourage you to experiment with other forms of prayer. And if there is a form of prayer that you've tried multiple times and it's not helpful for you, then stop doing it. Nobody says that you have to pray in any particular form of spirituality or any particular form of prayer. We are offering these to you as a tool that you can add to your tool belt. If it's helpful for you, that's wonderful. If it's not helpful for you, that's perfectly fine. It doesn't have to be your cup of tea because God created seven, 7 billion of us and we're not all the same. And we can relate to God in different ways through different routes. That's one of the insights of sort of finding God in all things. That it, it doesn't have to be the be all and end all for you in particular. So that, I hope that's helpful. All right, uh, anything else? Uh Let's see here. Uh, will classes be offered multiple times a year or only after Christmas? So are we, uh, we mentioned there are several different kinds of Ignatian programming that we do over the course of the year. They're offered at different times and some of them are repeated. So for example, we did the examine program both in the fall and in the spring. We offered the encountering the living God program in the fall and in the spring. So different things are available at different times. Um, this year, of course, everything is just a little bit odd because of COVID. So trying to say what exactly we're going to be doing when is a little hard at this point. Um, but hopefully when things get back to normal, we'll, be, we'll have a better ability to get back into a more regular rhythm of offering things multiple times. Hope that answers your question. Also, we are recording this event tonight. If anybody, if you want to recommend it to any of your friends, I'm sure it'll be up in a few days. Um, are there, are these, are all of these programs offered via Zoom? And at this time, yes. Yes, be, because of the situation we're in right now, everything that is being offered is being offered via Zoom. We're hoping that by next fall, this is not a promise. Father Shea would have my head if I promised this, but we are hoping by next fall that things will get back to normal and that we'll be able to start doing things in person again. But of course, that all depends upon people getting vaccinated and things getting under control. So I realize that Zoom is suboptimal for a lot of people. Um, I feel it too, but we're doing our best to offer what we can through the media that are currently available to us. All of these things, of course, work better when you're in person than they do online. And we hope to be able to return to being able to do them in person again as soon as we can. Well, just a lot of thanks and, and thanks to everybody else who mm -hmm. has joined us and has given us, a, uh, given us some questions to ponder. All right. Well, then I would like to, sorry? I think that's all I have. Now, okay. if anyone signed on um, and had not already given us your email, if you would send that to communications with an S at ST, so short for Saint Peters with an S, Catholic.org. So it's communications at St. Peter with an S, St. Peter's Catholic .org. And if um, when in doubt, go to our website and you'll find um, either Father Ray or myself, we're listed as staff and you'll see us and uh, can email us. All right. Well, then I'd like to bring our time together tonight to an end by just as we started with a prayer from the beginning of the spiritual exercises, I'd like to offer a prayer from the end of the spiritual exercises. 
All of Ignatian spirituality is oriented towards increasing your freedom, helping you encounter God so that you are free to offer yourself to God, to love God and to serve God as well as you possibly can. And so there is a prayer that Ignatius offers at the end of the spiritual exercises that's called the Sushipe, which is just the Latin word uh, for the first word of this prayer that I'm going to pray. And so I'm going to invite you again to be comfortable and pray this prayer along with me if you like. I'm going to put it up on the screen. And this is a prayer that some people find challenging, I have to admit, ahead of time. But it's a prayer that is a prayer of total offering to God, because that is where we are aiming to get, to be at a point where we can offer all that we are back to the God who created us and gave us everything we are and everything we have. And so, feel free to pray this with me. Take, Lord, and receive all my liberty my memory, my understanding, and my entire will, all I have and call my own. You have given all to me. To you, Lord, I return it. Everything is yours. Do with it what you will. Give me only your love and your grace. That is enough for me. Amen.